Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is uh, joining us today for the last webinar of CTT. Uh, we do appreciate you for coming. We understand that it is a bit late in some places, uh, but we appreciate you for joining us on the very last webinar of the CTT course. We're very excited to have you here. Um, and for having you throughout the entire course. Um, we have seen all the activity forums, all your responses, all your contributions on Telegram, and we really do appreciate your participation in the course. Um, as we come to the end of the course, there are a few things we would want um, to get feedback from you. And you have seen um, one of the surveys that I shared today morning about uh, tell us your story. Please do take the time to share some of the stories that you have experienced through this uh, CTT course, as well as through your teaching experience. Um, there will also be an end of course um, survey that will be sent out tomorrow. So please be on the lookout for that as well and take the time to share information with us because it really helps us to better the course for future cohorts. Other than that, um, you still do have time to complete the course and to you know, get your certificates. Uh, so keep participating in the activity forums. Uh, should you need an extension to finish the course, uh, we are willing to extend the course by at least a week and you will be able to complete at least before Christmas. I'm sure a lot of you are wondering how and when you will get your certificates. So once the course closes uh, within the next two weeks, you should have received um, your certificates. And we are hoping that there will not be any hiccups and you'll be able to receive them within um, the next two weeks. During this webinar, we will also have a Q&A session. Uh, so please do remember to input your questions in the Q&A uh, section of um, Zoom, and we'll be able to get to them after, after the session is over. And uh, today we are joined by a guest speaker, uh, who are, whom I'm very excited to introduce. Uh, we're joined by Evelyn Kassina, uh, who is the founder of Eve Minute Kenya. Uh, she's a family IT consultant and a very big advocate for online safety, especially for families and children. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to hand it over to our guest speaker, Evelyn. Welcome. Thank you so much. And I think I'll begin also by saying good morning and or good evening to all of you from wherever you're joining from. I'm happy again to be able to interact with you after a whole year. And I just hope that through this webinar, uh, which is the last one, you will have additional content to take home with you and to take back to your places of work, but also have an idea on how to impact the lives of children. Because I believe as we are all seated here in one way or another, we do impact the lives of children. And yes, I've seen somebody from Zambia. Um, hi from Zambia. So allow me to start by sharing my screen. All right, so UNESCO was doing um, continuous assessment, as I said earlier, on the use, the, the impact of technology within the global education sector. And one of the things that I know is that we are looking at technology in a very different light at the moment which is a good thing because COVID is also helping our governments, quote unquote, to push for progressive change of policy and laws that have been there that were not really progressive due to technology. And so it is a good thing that we had COVID. And it's also a good thing that we were all thrown in the deep end and started learning, you know, how to swim in this space of teaching online. But I hope even as your, your learners have gone, come back to school physically, I hope you're still using digital technologies to continue your interaction with them. So if you can share with me on chat so that at least you're able to see your impact. Did you find that you needed to reteach children on life skills because they were so glued on, TV, on the screens? Um, was communication an issue? That would be a very good thing for us to see so that at least we can interact um, further. But even as we are in that space, I want you to reflect on the regular screen time for a typical child within your space. 
So maybe you think about your own child at home, but also think about the children that you interact with. What do you think is their typical screen time at home? Yeah, because they have access in one way or another. I keep saying this and people laugh that in Africa, in our continent, we actually do have so many internet enabled gadgets than we have toilets because we have had issues with toilets. I know even in my own country, yes. But even if you look at your own home, you probably have more gadgets than you have toilets. Is that something to laugh about? Maybe, but it's good humor, yeah? So if you reflect on that screen time, can you, do you feel as, a, as an educator, there is an important, there's an importance and an urgency to have the conversation on digital citizenship, but with the emphasis on online safety? Because we need to be able to see the spaces where, how and when we can have these conversations with learners why some of these things we are learning right now, maybe they're not in, inbound in the curriculums that we're teaching. But I'm sure the same way we teach our children how to wash hands, how to blow their noses, I think those are life skills we can start extending on the conversations on screen time. So we need to look for opportunities within the day, different interactions from the playground to the classroom, to the places we eat, something, can be taught somewhere because learning happens anywhere, yeah? In my profession as a trust and safety practitioner, online safety themes come in these particular ways, okay? So we will interact with them either when we are doing privacy and security, digital footprint and identity, communication and building relationships. Of course, there's well-being, which is a big conversation now on how we are thinking about mental health conversations, and taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of other people. And then, of course, there's digital drama. If you have been on Twitter, Kenyans are famous to be bullies on what we call Kenyans on Twitter. We have brought down governments. We have brought down celebrities who have tried to, you know, come and invade the, our space, you know, on the, on the internet through that particular platform. And when we talk about drama, even as teachers, we are faced with a bit of drama where we find, you know, students don't like how we dress. They don't like how we look. They don't like how we pronounce certain things. They create memes. And then they've developed certain groups online on, on, on you know, Instagram, on WhatsApp, the different platforms they meet. And they start posting those things. And somehow we get to see them and feel really bad. And it also affects our well-being. And these are the things that, when they don't know how to control, they can get out of hand. I felt that within this particular, this particular year, I know we have talked about you know, how to do security for our children and all, but the social cycle element of it is something that we have to go back and see how to start developing it for those who don't have those developments, but also how to emphasize digital well-being, but specifically in the theme of digital footprint and identity. The reason I picked this is again, as a practitioner, I feel like my other job is firefighting. Firefighting in the sense that I'm called to go talk to children who have misbehaved online, but they don't want us to report so that we are able to protect them. They have you know, sent inappropriate content online. They have broken the law in some ins instances, but also sometimes they are breaking, they, they are behaving in a way that is not decent, that is actually causing harm to other people. They are doing these things in a place where content lasts forever, yeah? And I felt it is important for us to keep having these conversations with kids where we tell them that digital footprint is on the internet forever. It has the memory of an elephant, it never forgets. And we need to start helping them to cultivate an identity and responsible use by giving them empowerment, yeah? At the end of the day, as a parent, I keep saying I will feel very bad if I found my children's photos, voices, images that have been shared in any inappropriate way online. I will feel terrible and feel very bad. But at the end of the day, it is not my content. It is their content. And so when we keep helping them to see they have a huge responsibility, they start rethinking on how to cultivate a digital space that is good for them, yeah? So I will focus on digital footprint and identity. However, 
I will share content that you can consume on the other themes so that within those different spaces, if you feel like digital drama, like bullying and harassment is something that is a problem in your, in your place or something that really needs urgency, at least you'll have content for that. And of course, always having conversations around digital well-being. So solutions, okay? When we think about solutions and digital citizenship, I want us to think critically on how to build values. As, an, as a continent, I feel like we have values that are so dear to us, but somehow we don't know how either to express them, or maybe when we express them, they tend to rub other people the wrong way. Because anytime we are online, we need to understand that we are global citizens. So you cease to be like, for me, I cease to be just a Kenyan, I become a global citizen. Our children are growing in a space where their cultures are so intertwined. They, they interact with people from different continents. They share that culture, they share religion, they share language. And because they're also still learning about our culture, it becomes something that is, the cultures become very wide for them. And so we need to start thinking critically on how we need to project our culture. We need to project our communication and what is very dear to us. Because as I keep saying, we are not always with them the whole entire time. So we need to be able to help them do the values. We need to be able to help them create boundaries. We need to be able to help them build relationships because of course now they build them online and offline. And then of course, communicate with civility. So in this, in this webinar, I felt it is important for us to talk about the social, the social emotional learning part of it, where it is all about building relationships, understanding why it is very important for us to have the conversation of being digital citizens. I, I know you're a consumer of the internet and just yesterday, I do believe it was yesterday, there's a um, famous dancer who just committed suicide. And when you look at his, his TikTok and his Instagram, especially, he never showed any signs, any signs whatsoever of having any issues. But it's because when you're having mental health problems, they're not written on you. They're not written. Sometimes you're smiling, but behind the smile, there's a problem. So we need to start also as teachers, start noticing red flags. When you see there's a child who is withdrawing or they're out, out looking for attention because they're misbehaving or something, we call those red flag feelings. And at what point do you intervene and say you need to help this child by figuring out what exactly is the problem? At what point do you bring in the community, the outside people within the school, the parents, you know, if, if, you, if you, you want to look for legal, you want to look for the law, we need to start knowing at what point do we involve who and why, yeah? We need to understand that the choices that we make and we start interacting with online, they have consequences and they have impacts to us, they have impacts to other people. And so when I'm even giving you this particular content to interact with, I need you to, to, to pay keen attention to something I call the rings of responsibility. So when you're teaching a child from whatever age, the young ones to even the ones in university, they need to understand one, they have a responsibility to themselves. Number two, they have a responsibility to the society then they have a responsibility to the world in general. And each one of those layers, have the, we have to be bound by the laws of the land. We have to be bound by culture. Some of us have to be bound by religion. It depends on what you're interacting with. But as an educator, the best interest of the child, because that is what drives us. Anytime we are teaching, best interest of the child, what is the best interest of this child? So anytime you have any access, and a child is either misbehaving, what is the responsibility they have to themselves? Because they're creating a footprint for themselves. What responsibility do they have to the community? And also what responsibility do they have to the world? So that at least we are able to see when we are telling them, fine, we are giving you this access, you already have it. These are our expectations when you're using these technologies. Of course, we also live in a space where, you know, news is all over. And news is really information. And if you look at, like, I'll give an example of my country, Kenya. In October, there's the cybersecurity awareness, uh, the cybersecurity report that was launched in my country. And one of the biggest, biggest threats 
in terms of cybersecurity was misinformation. Misinformation and malinformation and disinformation. All that saying that, you know, somebody did this, they say that when everybody right now who has a phone is already a journalist sending information everywhere, it could have potential harm. And so we need to start also thinking. When we start seeing, you know, our learners, they have phones in school, they are creating memes, they're abusing us, they're abusing other students, they're creating drama. What is the impact of all these things when it comes to reporting news and having information out there? Because somebody will read it and believe it. Somebody will reshare that information and it starts causing a web of issues. So we need to start seeing within the class, what kind of issues are you facing when the children came back? What is the root cause? What are the medias of transmission of this particular information? Then what can you as, a, as, a, as an educator do to help these children see the impact of what they are doing online. And of course, I felt that, you know, within these solutions, for us, we have to have the cognizance and the agency to have emotional learning. This is where we are supporting the students. But I keep saying it is important to, to want to support somebody else, but we have to start supporting ourselves. What you're doing right now, taking you know, your time to sit here and listen, you've taken your time to do a whole course. You're taking care of yourself because one, you know that information is power. You know that you need to learn so that you're able to also teach. But also you need to see, is what we are being taught going to affect me as a person? And if you have, you know, those ticks that, okay, fine, I feel like maybe I'm abusing social media a lot. Maybe I'm feeding too much information. It is, it is making me react in a certain way. Learn how to cope. And then when you learn how to cope and mitigate those issues, at least you will know how to support somebody else who's going through something similar. So we need to create a web or a community of support. As teachers, have a support group. As educators, have a support group. If you feel like there are things that you need to cross-share, like information and experiences, those things are always welcome to do that. Self-awareness is also hand in hand with learning because of course you have to, to introspect to see how identity affects your online activities. We know that we are what we consume. So if you find that you're consuming healthy content, at least you, you are on purpose to engaging with healthy content. If you're, if you're consuming a lot of unhealthy content, again, your identity form your habits. And as we look at these things, I feel it is important as an emerging threat, gender stereotypes is something that we need to start having ways and the language to address and to communicate. I'll give an example. Right now, there's a conversation about, say, the LGBTQ because of their gender stereotyping. We have our biases. Is you have a bias maybe from religious, a religious sector, you have a bias from an African perspective because of your culture, you have a bias. But when a child is being bullied online and they are your student under your care, how do you protect that child based on their, the gender they have decided to attain because, and other people are taking advantage of that and making them feel bad, they're bullying them, it becomes a mental health issue, and everything around their life is just going east and west. What is your responsibility, your duty of care? When we have self-awareness and self-respect, as educators, we need to start having the language and the support to give when we start seeing some of these things happening because they're happening in schools and the children maybe don't know how to communicate at home. And we know as educators, we are the ones who spend a lot of time with, uh, with the children um, an active time for that matter, morning to evening, we have active time that we spend with the children. So we need to know how our duty of care extends and we need to start learning the languages on how to interact with these things. When we are teaching children, we need to help them understand their footprint keeps growing. Think about the WhatsApp group you're in right now or in the Telegram group. When somebody sends something, it has reached maybe a hundred people. When they send to another group, it's another hundred people. Think around five or 10 minutes of one video that is going viral, how many people it would have reached. That information stops being about them posting. It's about also the resharing, the resharing and how many people are seeing that information. So footprint, it keeps growing. And in this particular, um, the, the content that I have for you today, I will even show you how 
people are losing and also gaining opportunities based on what they put out there for audience. Our students also need to know that the audience can be invisible and visible. There are people who just pass by, you know, they see the content, they don't react, they don't say anything, but they have seen and they've taken mental notes. Those people could be potential employers, potential university, um, you know, HR people, you know, it could be a friend who wanted to be somebody's friend. And then because of the kind of things they're posting, they're like, that one is a hot cake. I do not want it or a hot potato. We have invisible audiences and they also create narratives on how people miss or get opportunities online. And that's why the fifth point says, it's not just about you. The minute you release that information, you've delegated and relegated all the responsibility. You, have you almost have zero control over what can be done with that content. So we need to start also training children. Yes, you're consuming, but the minute you start creating content, are you creating something you're proud of? Are you creating things that will build your life? Are you creating things that could potentially harm yourself or other people? Those are the questions they need to start asking. But also, those are the questions we need to start asking about ourselves so that at least we're able to help them from a point of knowledge. As well, because we don't raise children in a vacuum, there are very many people who have access to the child. We need to know as, as educators and practitioners at what point do we rope in the guardians? At what point do we bring in the parents? At what point do we say, we need to have conversations of people who are building certain platforms that our children use because maybe we feel they need to filter A, B, C, D. Maybe we feel they need to let our children access certain things. You are a stakeholder, but there are other stakeholders who have critical data and access to the same child that you're trying to protect. So are you in alignment or is everybody working in parallel lines? So there's something that I felt I needed to share maybe because you're seated here and you're also a parent and it's called share, sharing, sharing. So you're sharing as a parent where you just, you keep posting excessive and sensitive details about children's lives on the online space. I remember last year, I mentioned something to do with private information and personal information that I remember sharing. And if you've forgotten, Personal information is information that somebody can use to just describe you. Like, for instance, I wear glasses today I'm not wearing. But then you can say, Evelyn is that lady who has dreadlocks or the lady who is black who has glasses. Something that you feel is unique about Evelyn that you can use to describe Evelyn maybe in a group. Private information will be where I live, where I go to school, my phone number, Maybe for, for students, it would be parents, parents' numbers, you know, social ID numbers, those things that really can cause a security threat when they land in the hands of somebody who does not have the best interest of that person. Now, sometimes we are happy, we go for school trips, and we are glad that we're having fun and we want to share that experience with the world. Then we take videos and photos. First mistake we do is that we don't ask for the children's consent. Okay, can I take your photos and videos? Fine. Why are you taking the photos and videos? I want to share so that people can see the experience. As a school, we expose our children to different things because you want to also sell what unique things your school does for students, all right? But then as you're taking those photos, are the students in any uniform that can potentially show exactly which school they are in? So that will be a sweater with a logo or something that has actually a logo that can, if I zoom in, I will see this particular child goes to this particular school. That is a potential threat. And so what I keep saying is, anytime you're taking videos or photos that have a minor, ask for their consent. Sometimes they need to understand that when things are being posted online, again, as it said here, it's not only about what they post. What other people post on their behalf, it creates a digital footprint. Ask for consent. Make sure if there's any potential private information, like you will do a video and then maybe the, the address of where you are is being seen at the back. Or as a cybersecurity threat, maybe your Google Maps is on. And then when you're posting, it shows exactly where you are because your pin locator is on and you're online and it gives all that information. We need to be very cognizant on protecting children, especially when we are going into the online space. Because I know we are already interacting um, on that space. 
as we are moving also, I felt the how. The how is a lot on what I call building resilience. Throughout growing, even for us as we were growing, uh, what our parents always used to do is help build resilience. And resilience is built for two purposes, for people to be independent, but also because we are not always with our children. So let me speak to you who's a parent. You're not always with your child. And you want, when somebody is pressuring them to doing something, you have taught them about boundaries, you have taught them about values, and at that moment when it is very critical and you're not there, they can make a decision that is best for them. Yeah? So in our learning, we need to see how we can build resilience. One of the things that I felt was very important was the issue of self and social awareness. I don't know if I asked you right now who you are, you're able to describe who you are <laughs> without saying I'm a teacher, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I have, I have these certificates and that. Who are you as a person without all those attachments or all those gifts or all those certificates? Who are you? Yeah. And if you struggle with that question, imagine how your child would answer the same question when they're asked who they are. Because your identity shapes who you become in society, your values, your beliefs, your ethos, they shape. So when we start having conversations on miscommunication, on how the data we receive and how we perceive it shapes our actions, it starts building it starts building a society that does not have a grounding. And so because at home, that is where values are taught, we need to be able to start at home. But we still, as a parent, I know you will send your child to a place where it is close to home, where the values I'm teaching at home can be extended in school. That's where we are found. And so that social awareness has to align. We need to teach children about management, managing themselves such that Yes, we have given them an opportunity to enjoy technology. We didn't have that opportunity. We started interacting with technology late. But the distractions that come and the pressure that comes with social media, especially in gaming, how do we help them with management? In school, it could be as simple as helping them create a schedule. That is within your, your, your jurisdiction. You help them create a schedule. When they wake up in the morning, what are they supposed to do? When do they start accessing screen time? What kind of screen time is it? Self-management. We need to have the ability to help children create those kind of uh, schedules in their life. Responsible decision-making. That is where a lot of critical thinking is needed. We have different laws in our countries. In our different countries, we do have different laws. We also have global laws, but also when your child feels they can hide because nobody's seeing, they, they go into what I call a gray area and they start feeling, yes, I'm, am I being responsible? I can play with this. I can play with this situation and see how far I can get away with it because they're looking at all the gray areas and all the places that they can skip. But as you're trying to help them with responsible decision-making, I want you to remember that once upon a time, once upon a time, you are a teenager. And once upon a time, you also tried to circumvent the law. So yes, they are being children just the same way you are a child when you are their age. Just that their space is very different from ours. When they're online, that information they think they're hiding <laughs> might not be the case. For instance, I'll give an example of... Uh, a school that I interacted with where some kids opened a private group, a closed group, and they were creating memes about teachers. And they thought, mm, we will not be found. Somehow, somebody shared that information on WhatsApp. And then it started making rounds on WhatsApp. So what gave these children away? They used the logo of the school. They used the logo of the school. So immediately, we, they already knew who. And then they used an email address that pinned down the person who opened that particular group. Of course, when she was squeezed, she said everybody else, yeah? Everybody else who was a participant, they said. But when we found out, you know, it is this, we found out one group, 
we came to realize there were several. So it was one school that was sharing within the school, but they'd also created a network of schools. So different admins used to share different memes of different teachers. The problem with that is when they become, you, they, they move from one stage of learning to another stage of learning, that information still stays there, okay? They become adults, that information still stays there. But when they're looking for opportunities out there and they're asked how they react or how they interact with people, somebody will pull that information that they posted in 2022 that they can't even remember. And it was maybe a joke to them. And at that point, they lose on integrity and they lose an opportunity. So responsible decision-making, not to make them fear, but to make them know that what they post has an impact. So what impact is it, okay? Then of course, we find ourselves in a space where our learners are really interacting a lot online, which means most of their relationships also, whether they were formed offline, they're really happening on the digital platforms. So we need to be able to help them see to what extent do they share what kind of content so that at least they're able to know there is a boundary still, even on the online space, as much as they're connecting, there are boundaries. So you and I as educators, our role is to support them in that emotional learning, having the understanding that your children are coming from maybe being pre-teenagers to teenagers to young adults. There is a whole process and in that process, they're also growing and experiencing different things. So don't come in between their creativity. Don't stifle their growth. Be there to walk along them, alongside them, so that at least you're helping them build the, the skills that they need to survive on the internet, okay? Um, I wanted us to emphasize on the benefits of the conversation we are having today. And I want to throw this to you as a teacher or as a parent. What is your why? Everybody normally has a reason why they do things. So for you, why is it important as an educator to have a conversation around online safety? What is it you saw? Or what is it you fear? And maybe that will derive your why. If you can share that with us on the chat, that will be so amazing because it will help us also just interact and see, oh, I never thought about this issue in this way. And it comes from um, such kind of interaction. So please, Use the chat to share what you feel. Your why is, is in, your why. Why is it important for you to have this conversation so that at least we're able to learn from each other as well? So I loved sharing stories. And there is this boy, 10 year old, who he comes from the States. I will share the link so that you're able to read the whole brief of the story, but I'll give you a snippet of it. He has this VR goggles. And as you know, right now, Children are having access to now mobile. It is not a new thing. They have access to mobiles. They have access to TVs. They have access to computers. So the next technologies that are coming, when we are interacting with the metaverse, they will need to have virtual reality headsets. Right now, they're quite pricey, but I'm sure you can still get them for very little money, but they're a bit pricey. This boy wanted to have a VR set. He went and asked the mother if he could have a VR set. At that point, the mother said no. The boy became crazy. He, he really actually had a mental breakdown. And he had access to the mother's safe. In that safe, the mother used to keep a gun. Because when you read this story, you will see the chain of events that led to him actually shooting the mother because he was unable to get, the mother was unable to buy for him a VR set at the, at the time he wanted. So he went to the safe, got the mother's gun, went where the mother was washing clothes. He tried to, you know, bully her with the gun. Maybe his intentions were not, but he pulled the trigger, shot the mom. The mother actually died instantly, but she was trying to come and get the gun from him and then they had her at a tussle. What really happened next, will surprise you. Before even cops came to the house, he went to the mother's Amazon account and got himself <laughs> that VR set. So as the police were coming to get the mother's body from the house, Amazon people were bringing this VR set that caused that incident. This is an extreme case, very extreme, but it is a case that is happening. Some of the things that our children are facing right now 
is pressure, a lot of pressure. They go online, there's a new game that just came up. There is something, um, there's a new game that just came up. There's a new social media platform that is out. I don't know if you have seen the, the challenges on social media platforms. They want to participate in these challenges. So what happens? Pressure. They come and mount pressure. They come and mount pressure. And then when things don't go their way, you start having meltdowns. That's why I felt it was important for us to have the conversation on mental health because we need to support children as much as possible. And we need to know what are those triggers? Why are they feeling how they're feeling? What does it mean when they're on those platforms? For instance, they want to do a dance challenge. A dance challenge is not really bad, but in the same platforms, they will start interacting with challenges that can be very dangerous for them or other people. And you have interacted with these things. So we need to have, you know, even if it is in a, in a, on an assembly day and it's 10 minutes, tell children about, you know, we are what we consume. Over the weekend, they're going for a long break. You know, tell them, okay, just monitor what you're doing, how it makes you feel. Then they can come and share over the, on, on the following week how maybe being on a certain platform made them feel. Patricia, are you done trying to call me? I'm sorry, Patricia? Patricia? Uh, no, no okay. it's okay. Thank you. Can that. I continue? Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. All right. I know with us here, we have people, uh, educationists from you know, basic education all the way to university. This particular news, and I will, it will be shared with you, but I want you to listen to it. It's a long video. I will not play it now, but I will tell you a little bit about it. In 2020, in 2020, just when COVID hit the world and we went on lockdown, Harvard University had released a list of students they had taken for the year 2021, yeah? And these people already had their admission letters. They had qualified. Some of them were on sponsorship. To be taken in a university like Harvard normally is such joy, even for parents, but, but mostly for the students. But the parents, I know they feel it's as if they're the ones who go to the school. But then the human resource department keeps, right now the human resource departments are really doing a lot of due diligence to know the kind of people they're bringing into their spaces. So they went and did some search on the number of students and at least 15, there were 15 students. Their, their um, applications were rescinded because they were found in a closed WhatsApp group. Again, they think that because it is closed, people cannot see these things. They were found in a closed WhatsApp group sharing all manner of information. And when, when their applications were rescinded, it was very clear. It said, your values do not align <laughs> with the values of our institution. That was it, because they signed a code of conduct. And so even with our young adults, somebody has made a snide comment somewhere online. And even, even without typing something, they put an emoji of laughing. What are they doing in essence? Endorsing that comment. They have endorsed that comment. It might have been a bad thing, but when they put an emoji of love, hands up, something that is funny in them, they think it's funny, they have endorsed that thing. So when HR practitioners, and right now it's, it's algorithms really, it's artificial intelligence that is doing this work. It keeps flagging all these things. So your child or your student will be called into an interview. They will have all the merits, the grades, but their social, psychosocial welfare, their well-being, their manners, it makes them lose on opportunities. So it is my responsibility, it is your responsibility to see how we can help them to navigate this, this space because unfortunately for us, we didn't have to worry about those things when we were children like them. So that is the biggest difference, all right? I know we don't raise children in a vacuum. It is important to know what community we have and how we can bring them in to help us raise children. We have churches, we have religious groups, we have the, the judiciary, we have the people of the law, we have platforms, we have industry, we have parents and guardians. So even the non-teaching staff, they have a responsibility in this ecosystem to help children to know how to be responsible digital citizens. And so involve, involve the community, share knowledge. When you're doing sports day, do something, um, do a post, do an announcement, do a skit. All those opportunities, I said you have something to learn somewhere. 
make them available so that at least even the community knows this is your responsibility, this is my responsibility to raise these children in a certain way. Involve parents. In my particular school, because I'm still in basic education, we use things like WhatsApp groups to just keep sharing with parents. Maybe we forgot to write something in the diary, but we feel it's very urgent, we need to share it with parents. We will post it on our WhatsApp group and apologize because we didn't send it the, the, the normal way the school does it. But at that particular point, if you have that opportunity to have a group, share. You have newsletters, share that information. Build capacity, but also share. Create awareness as much as possible. And I know your facilitators have given you resources, endless resources. Pick one, one theme per term and say, this term, we are going to focus on this. It is our safety theme. Next term, we shall do this. And then categorize it within the classes so that whatever you're saying to a teenager or a young adult, you have the words and the understanding for the people who are in basic education, and especially the very, very young ones. So we need to have that understanding to know we need to involve parents. We need to build capacity. We need to also create awareness. But then in that space, we need to know the law, the laws of your land, but also the global laws. And one of the biggest things that is hitting education, uh, the education sector right now is data protection. So have you read the GDPR? GDPR stands for data protection, um, um, global data protection regulation. So try and see how that particular, the GDPR affects you as an institution, you as a parent, you as a practitioner. Then your data protection laws. In our country, we have a data protection law. It is more framed from the GDPR, but then it also helps us to localize what is being done globally to our local laws. So please be aware. Do you have a Child Protection Act? What does it say? What provisions can you use to share information with parents, to share information with the non-teaching staff, also to share information with the children on how they're supposed to, to uh, maintain themselves and live? So that at least when you're talking about digital reputation, you have content, you have awareness, you also have incidences that you can share because I also believe a lot when you keep sharing even your own experiences with them, it makes them have a mental image on how things can go, either very well or very bad. Within your learning, try as much as possible to balance. Share the good stuff, not only the bad stuff. Share the good stuff because the internet is really a great space where we can all learn and we have seen amazing things, even coming from our own continent, where people are innovating, people are sharing a lot of content. So be part of that generation that is helping children see you can leverage on this technology. We didn't have that chance, but they do. So keep building that awareness for them so that at the back, of, at the back end, when you're teaching the core competencies, when you're teaching the actual content, you are also building a person you will be proud to see in the society or in the marketplace doing amazing things because of the efforts you're making here today. So avoid being the person who is sharing excessive or sensitive details about children, ask for consent, but also if you have to share any information about children, please make sure you have either put an emoji somewhere where maybe there was a logo or something that would show private information around them, before you put it out there, but ask for consent. If they do say no, please respect that because you are also creating a footprint on their behalf. Where it is possible, show them what repercussions they can face when they start violating these laws. Because just because they're children doesn't mean they cannot stand in front of a law, a court of law to answer for the mistakes that they have done. We also have those responsibilities to keep telling them to be law-abiding citizens, to keep being framed by the laws of the land, but not in any way to stifle their creativity, not in any way to make them live in fear. It is just that know there's a responsibility. Always know that there's a responsibility that you have to be an upstanding digital citizen. I hope this training has helped you know that there's something you can learn. So from this particular slide, I will go back to it, this particular slide. Maybe the digital footprint is not an urgent emergency for you as a practitioner. You can pick one of the others so that you make it a theme. Then you can come up with content 
and see in your own areas of interaction, what can you rope in to enhance the efforts of online safety? So I'm going to take this back to Patricia. I can see the comment section has 99 plus comments. I don't know if there are questions. So let me take it back to Patricia so that at least we can do the question and answer. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for that very, very informative uh, presentation. I'm sure all the participants would agree with me that that really added value to the content that they had already um, consumed through the course, and it really complemented the course really well. Um, the comments you're seeing are actually an answer to your question on the why. Uh, what is your why? And they have shared um, really amazing reasons on why uh, they would want to uh, learn about these and also implement um, student online safety um, in their schools. So I think I can read just a few uh, so that you can um, get answers to that question. Uh, so one of uh, the students says that uh, my why, it's all about digital footprint and safety. What minors post stay online forever and may not sit well with them in the future. So safety, um, on safety, someone can always take advantage of them. And so it's important to teach them about these things. And then um, there's someone who says that my why is to teach responsible use of the internet and to expose as many to all the opportunities available, which most of them are free. Let me see whether I can find one last one. Um, another person shares that it is very important to help children become responsible users of, the so of social media. Um, and one last one, um, it's really most um, and highly desirable for 21st century teachers and any person that wants to learn, um, wants to learn cybersecurity and practice it. So um, thank you very much for sharing this, um, that question with the teachers because uh, they've shared really amazing reasons for why they would want to be, to teach their students about online safety. Now we can go on to the questions. Um, there is one from the chat uh, that says, I have seen some schools that have printed the school's email address at the gate. Is that a threat? That is general communication. It's, uh, if, if it's just the school's email address particularly, if maybe the school is called Patricia, let me use that, patricia at gmail.com and that's the name of the school. That is not really a threat because they're taking in information about the school. Mm -hmm. However, if it is um, an, a domain, a domain based email, you can ask this, the provider or the, yeah, the host really, it's the, normally the host to put in filters on any inappropriate content that may come through that email address. Because of course there are threats that can come through an email or a domain that can affect many other things that are within the network of that space. So no, it is not really a threat, but it is good to have safeguards on the back end so that at least they filter anything like malware, anything like, you know, taking somebody can come into that space to steal the identity or information about the students. So it, you, you need to really be careful how, um, what kind of safeguards have been put behind. But the same way we have our website, because even when you have a website on the internet, it is literally everywhere and it has, um, an information email and a phone number that people can call. And generally it is for people to be able to get information about that institution. So no, it's not, but have the IT people ask for safeguards for behind the scene. Absolutely, I, I agree with you because we cannot uh, fully kind of um, get away from the internet and uh, you know shield ourselves from participating on the internet and so emails are important it just that to make sure that at the end of the day um the emails that are received are well filtered and uh, your email security is really good to make sure that uh, spam emails are not getting to you to make sure that um, unsolicited links are not getting to you any links that could be used to solicit information from you are not getting to the users of this particular email. So yes, I do agree with you. Thank, thank you for that answer. 
Uh, there's also another question. Um, someone in the chat said that uh, their 13 year old boy created a Facebook account using my phone and my phone number. And um, because I have 2FA for almost all my accounts, um, they realized that ha that happened. And so um, they told, they showed him a video of a boy who was indoctrinated to becoming a terrorist. And hence, um, he stopped, but I still would want him to be internet savvy. How do I do it safely? Um, I can take that one as well. Um, okay. There's a win in that. At least you were able to block complete registration because they needed to factor authentication. So at least you know you've put an extra layer of protection on your gadgets or um, your Facebook account in this case. But, and also another win is that they have seen how bad things can go. I think you and I maybe probably know that um, we've had in the news, there's this boy in Texas who first shot a grandmother, his grandmother at home and went in the school and started shooting on children. And it came from indoctrination or the radicalization from, um, it was gaming, they were playing, they were playing Grand Theft Auto. Yes, it was called Grand Theft, Grand Theft Auto. And these kind of games are constant radicalization. You know, they're playing, but they're playing those shooting games online, which sometimes they look very innocent. But imagine somebody who has now access to an actual weapon and they don't know the kind of destruction they can cause. And so it is very important to know that it is not only on video games, even on social media, specifically even Facebook. Like if you go on your Facebook account, because I know we are mostly on Facebook and there is a portal, I think it's on this side, this is uh, my right hand side, top right. You will, see, um, you will see a portal where there is games, yeah? And when you open that particular portal, you go into what we call third party apps. People who have created, you know, um, apps that can ride on the Facebook platform. And there you will find games that have been recorded, other games that are, are live being played. And even as a parent, you will feel you cringe when you see the kind of things that are being projected there. So if your child has already seen these things, you go back to the conversation on values. What is it doing to them? Because if somebody has been radicalized from merely playing a game, what does that mean in actual sense when they actually get, you know, they get actual weapons, they'll kill people. What does that mean to their freedom? They're giving it away. So in that, in that space, you have very many conversations to take advantage to have. That is where your freedom starts being challenged because you will lose your freedom when you're taken to jail. You will miss out on your life you will actually cause another family to miss out on their dependence or their loved one because you will have taken their lives. There are very many conversations to have building on the, 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 the topic of values and self-responsibility, self-awareness and responsibility. That is where you start having that conversation. But even as a parent, don't shy away from showing them how th bad things can go, depending on their age and depending on the language you choose to use so that you are not scaring them. Remember at the end of the day, you want to build resilience, not to scare and not to make them live in fear. You show them how things can actually go bad. People will lose freedoms, people will die and that is a, a, a last resort and have conversations around what that means as a ring of responsibility, bring that back. And I'll make sure I have, I have those, you know, those topics as uh, resources for you people to, be, to have availability on. So that anytime you have that chance, talk about the ring of responsibility, talk about you know, uh, self-awareness and social awareness so that at least they know this is where I stand. I hope that that helps, but congratulations on having an extra layer onto your social media platforms. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, there's also another question on, is it safe to log in um, on Wi-Fi provided in hotels? I can take that. Um, it is not advisable, but a lot of times uh, we cannot totally not do it because a lot of times, if, especially if you have traveled, you'll find that um, the hotel Wi-Fi is what you rely on for communication. And so we do advise that when, whenever this is the case, to avoid um, sharing any sensitive information through that particular network, for example, avoid uh, let's say checking your bank 
um, avoid logging into different sites because then if the network is not well protected, then those credentials could be stolen from you. So we do advise against it. But whenever you cannot avoid it, uh, make sure that you're not sharing any information that could be uh, very sensitive if it were compromised. Uh, we also do um, encourage the use of VPNs when you're using public Wi-Fi. Um, if you're not sure what VPNs are, you can do additional research on it. And uh, you could also join us for uh, our ACTT course, which is the Advanced Cybersecurity Training for Teachers course, uh, which will be beginning in January. And we actually cover VPNs and uh, the use of public Wi-Fi. So that is something um, that we discourage uh, people from using. But should you want to use the Wi-Fi, VPNs are very good at protecting your data. The next question is, does incognito mode help in avoiding digital footprints? And yes, to an extent they do because um, incognito mode does not store any browsing history. And so it can protect you from that. It can protect you from targeted ads. So if you want to search for something that could be a product, if you don't want to the next day start getting ads on your social media platforms and all that, you can use it in cognitive mode to prevent that um, browsing history from being added to your already existing browsing history. So yes, it does um, help a lot in avoiding digital footprints. All right, um, there is a comment that, um, this is not a question really, but um, maybe basic cybersecurity should be introduced in our basic education. And I think that is something that a lot of us share sentiments um, there in terms of um, making sure that it's incorporated into the curriculum because we're already pushing towards um, more blended learning and more technology enabled learning. And so we should teach children already um, how the internet works and how to be safe in it so that they can reap the benefits um, of the internet while uh, still remaining very safe. And also putting the parents and the teachers at ease as well. All right. Um, there's a question on, uh, should we be seeking consent of minors or their parents and or caregivers? Uh, Evelyn, can you take that? Yes, absolutely, always. In fact, at this particular point in time where everybody feels they can get a little mileage when they feel their data is being overexposed, we are the ones on the receiving end of penalties. We are the ones on the receiving end of lawsuits. So for your own school, even online, you can get a basic template for you no know, consent. We are going to use, okay, let me start. So if you're going to take children's photos for maybe a website, ask parents to tick and say yes. For those ones who agree, their children's photos can be on the website. For social media, the same. For newsletters, break it down as much as possible, as much as possible. So make sure it is clear it is for the website and it's for the website only. If it is for social media, it's for social media. If it's for internal communication, maybe that is a newsletters within your database, also make it clear it is for internal communication, not external. Um, if you're going to also take data in terms of um, you want people to subscribe to something, and these are parents and children, for a webinar like this one or a school event, for instance, if you're going to use a Google form, tell parents we are, we are taking this content for the purposes of sharing resources, okay? And once we are done, this is how we are going to to delete or we are going to destroy your information. So we are not going to store it past this time. And this is how we are going to destroy it. But we are also just picking for the purposes of lay down your purposes so that you're not leaving any gray areas for somebody to come and say, you took my photo, you posted it on Instagram and you said this was for the website only. Or you took my photo without my consent. My children cannot be online. Make sure you're very clear when you're doing events and those are the sports events, the webinars, even the physical events in school, make sure you have just a small note that says, give us permission to have a photographer or a videographer to take these memories. However, 
we would want to have some of the photos for these particular reasons. If you're, you're okay with us using your child, that is fine. If you're not, state it very clearly so that you remove any responsibility for, for, for backlash or also penalties. Because for instance, in my country, when we, we are in violation of data protection, the penalties are actually to the cost of like 40,000 shillings a day. Anytime you're, you're, you're violating a certain, a certain data breach, it is calculated per day. So imagine if somebody saw it a week ago and then they're telling you it was a week ago and then they're calculating for you every day, you actually will pay a lot of money. So try as much as possible to always ask for consent. Put it in writing. We are teachers and we know that is how things are done. Put it in writing so that at least you say, I'm okay or I am not okay. If you, even though you send an email, print something, put it in the diaries of the children so that they take them home physically. The parent needs to sign and say, I am okay or I'm not okay, so that at least you're always protected. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, maybe we can take one last question. And um, if your question has not been answered, we will share a document with all the answers for the unanswered questions from this webinar. So uh, not to worry, you'll be able to receive that. Uh, so there's a question on um, some participants need clarity on digital footprint. What is it? How can you minimize it? Things like that, yeah. So your digital footprint is any information about you that is posted online. The footprint could be out, your, out of your own posting or somebody has posted information about you and they have tagged you maybe on a post or a photo that has said, I was with this person at this particular place. So it is not just about what you post, it's about what other people also post about you. That is any information that can be tied to your name. That is what your digital footprint is. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and you can you can actually check your digital footprint by searching your name, very quickly search your name and different variations of your spelling uh, of your name, and you'll be able to see what is available online about you. And also to make sure that it's at par with um, the reputation you would like to have while online, you know, so that it's not um, contradicting your own personal brand. And a lot of times, if you do find information about you that is not right and you would not want um, it out there, um, it could be someone tagged you in a photo on Facebook. You could ask them to take it down or you could untag yourself. I think there's actually that feature. Um, if you find that the articles about you and that uh, the information is not correct, uh, please uh, reach out to the administrators of that site just to make sure that that information is corrected and uh, your digital footprint is as you would want it to be. You can also minimize it by, if you do find like accounts online that you haven't used in years, completely, you could actually delete those um, accounts if they are no longer useful to you. You could also unsubscribe from um, any site you've subscribed to um, just to minimize the things that are available about you online. And moving forward, of course, be very mindful of the things that you share. Uh, be very mindful of the privacy settings of your post and things like that to make sure that um, everything is at par with how you would want it to be. Uh, so if someone searches for your name, they find the right thing online. Yeah, um, so thank you very much maybe, for- Maybe I could add as well. Um, yes, absolutely. When, when it comes to your footprint, um, I think if you have applied for a visa, and I know we travel, so if you have applied for a visa and for some reason your visa is denied, it could be also because of your footprint. So sometimes we, post things we feel, okay, they're not supposed to be out there, then we delete them. That doesn't mean they've they've um, disappeared from the face of the internet. There are certain places they go to. And when, you know, in, international companies, even law, law organs are looking for information, there's a way they mint that information out, even from deleted quote unquote posts. So it is very important even for us to know that what we put, even things that we might not really think about, your visa application, your, your travel documents, you can actually be denied an opportunity to travel somewhere because of your, your footprint, because it can be looked at in a different light 
um, for with the place where you're going. So we need to be very, very mindful. And also now when we are training children, letting them know the places where they can actually fall short so that they don't, you know, start playing with the gray areas in that space. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that addition. Um, so we, we are coming to the end of the webinar, but just a few um, comments. Yes, the webinar and the um, our presenters slides will be shared with you um, so that you can peruse through it. Our recording will also be shared uh, so that you can go through this once again. We'll also answer the questions um, in the Q&A and uh, we'll share a document with you on that. I had mentioned that we'll have another installation of um, the Advanced Cybersecurity Training for Teachers course, which is um, ACTT beginning of um, January. So be on the lookout for that announcement and join us for more advanced cybersecurity um, knowledge and skills and techniques. Um, it is very practical and you will be able to learn so much more about how to protect yourself and your students while you're online. So thank you so much for joining us um, for this webinar and for the CTT course from the entire facilitation team. We're very grateful for having you here and um, happy holidays and enjoy the rest of your year. Thank you so much.